Another example of a renewable resource is lumber, or trees, or timber, or whatever you want to call it. Essentially, trees. We use trees for so many different things. We talked about it a little bit when talking about biodiversity, but things like furniture, houses, paper, pencils, a lot of things that we interact with on a daily basis originally came from trees, like money. Yes, money kind of sort of grows on trees. But the thing is, is that although trees grow and they can continue growing forever and ever and we can replant them, they're still considered a renewable resource. We could, just like fish, use too much trees so that they don't come back. And that's what this picture is showing you here. Here are, we have two mountains side by side. On the left hand side, this is an example of a place that was forested and then it was clear cut. And then here on the right hand side was an area that wasn't clear cut. Now it's not to say that trees haven't been cut down from the right hand side, but perhaps they were cut down in a more sustainable way. Now looking at this picture, you can imagine that these two different ecosystems are incredibly different. On the left with this clear cut, this unsustainable way of farming, we don't have habitat anymore, likely to have more erosion, things like that. So that's what we're going to explore here is kind of what happens when we get rid of all our trees. How does that impact the environment? But then also we do use trees. So how can we harvest trees in a more sustainable way? Some of the downsides of clear cutting, to give you an idea of what this picture is looking at, this is a satellite picture of a previously forested area. So all of this light brown uh, is dirt. And what all of this orange is, is actually water, but it's tainted orange because of all of the runoff that is coming from this bare soil. So one of the things that happens when you clear cut an ecosystem and get rid of all the trees in it is you lose your seed bank. By seed bank, I just mean seeds. You don't have seeds anymore. There's no surrounding trees to drop seeds. So although trees can definitely grow back and you can help them grow back, you need something to grow back from. If there's no remaining trees, that means there's no seeds. And if there's no seeds, they can't grow back. Yes, we as humans can go back and then purposely plant them, but that's more work and more money on our part. Whereas it would have been just a lot easier if we just didn't clear them all in the first place. Something else that can happen that I've mentioned and what we really see in this picture is erosion. Plants serve an incredible ecosystem service by holding soil together. But when you get rid of those plants, there is nothing holding that soil together. So when it rains, what you see is a lot of erosion, a lot of the soil leaking and leaching into our water bodies. This in and of itself isn't the worst thing in the world, but organisms that live in those aquatic environments probably care a little bit. For example, there's a lot of heavy metals in certain soils, and in this case, what we're actually seeing is a lot of iron that has now gone into the water and has been oxidized, which is why it's giving this bright orange color. There could also be other pollutants that can harm wildlife, and then also just dirt in general. Going from maybe a clear, riverine ecosystem to a very murky and muddy ecosystem will really change predator and prey dynamics. So as I mentioned just now, talking about polluted streams and habitat loss. Not just habitat loss for potentially the organisms living in those streams, but habitat loss for the organisms living in that forest. You no longer will have deer or other mammals that might be hiding from something. You're going to lose a lot of your bird species. So a lot of things need some sort of protection and some sort of habitat. And then finally, maybe what you care more about, or humans care more about at least, is there's more flooding. If it rains on an area that is very flat, that has no plants, that means there's not a lot of stuff to soak up that water. There's nowhere for that water to go. A little bit gets soaked up by the soil, but not nearly as much as if there was a tree there also soaking up that water. So you have these issues where if you have people who are living in an area that's been clear cut, you might get a lot of flooding. Pair that with maybe erosion, and now you have a recipe for a landslide, which we see a lot in different places around the world, particularly areas that have clear cut. But we can do something about it. You know, we recognize that we need timber resources and that we need to use this, but we can do it in a better way or a more sustainable way. For example, we have selective cutting. 
Here, you're choosing certain species or really certain individuals to take from the forest. Maybe these are the older trees, maybe these are the bigger trees, maybe these are the smaller ones, maybe the deformed ones, what have you. Uh, maybe you're choosing certain past a certain size so taking the older and bigger ones and leaving the younger ones there to grow but the point is for whatever criteria you have you're selecting for them which means you're leaving some behind as you can see here we're leaving quite a bit behind that means there's roots to hold that soil in place there's roots to soak in water from when it rains there's still habitat here for organisms so by using selective cutting you're actually getting rid of a lot of the downsides of clear cutting even though you're still getting a benefit out of it another example is strip cutting this isn't really as good as selective but it's at least better than clear cutting it's essentially clear cutting, but on a smaller scale. So instead of getting rid of the entire forest, you're only getting rid of a strip of forest. So you still have a way to get seeds into the new area. But as you can see, even in this picture, there is still some erosion left behind. But you have a little bit more trees as a buffer on either side. So it is beneficial because you're not losing all of the seeds and you're not having widespread erosion, but you're still gonna have erosion. You're still gonna have some of those downsides. This strip is not gonna grow back as quickly as say the empty spaces here because all the soil is still intact with our selective cutting. Now this map is looking at forestry in the United States and trying to give you an idea of how much we have used our forest resources here. So this is the map of 1620. Obviously in 1620, we did not have the entire United States mapped out. We didn't mark where trees were, but looking at seed profiles and soil, using various inferences based on weather, this is our best estimate as to where or what was forested in the United States uh, before European, or around the time European colonists came over. As you can see, Pretty much east of the Mississippi River, it's 100% forested. Out in the west, where it's a lot drier, uh, we see less, but we still have a fair number of forests in the west as well. Now fast forward 300 years, and here's our estimate of forest cover. Now I want to make a huge note, because you might see this in textbooks or online. This is an area of virgin forest. What that means is forest that has been around since 1620. So this is not showing forest cover in the entire United States in 1926. Now I will say in 1926 it was the height of our sawing and cutting down forests and it was our highest rates of deforestation in the 1920s but it wasn't like this. It wasn't like oh there's no trees anymore. There were totally trees around. It's just the amount of trees that were left over from you know, 300 years ago is gone. We chopped down a lot of forests in order to make way for farmland, in order to, you know, build houses and things like that. This is showing today, uh, so within the past 10 years, and you can see there's barely any forests that have, essentially there are barely any trees that exist back before European colonists came here. Take that as you will um it's a good representation of just how much of this resource we have used but at the same time trees come back and the united states is a great example of this this is a similar map this is representing a today map but this is looking at forest cover totally so comparing that to this map this is showing forest cover that's existed for the past 300 years this is what it is today and i'm going to swing back really quickly between these two images. So again, this is virgin forest, what we estimated for 1620, and this is what it is today. It is less today than it was back then, but not by that much. We have been able to regrow our forests. Now there's not too many downsides between what we refer to as an old growth forest, so a forest that has trees that are hundreds of years old, versus a new growth forest, it's mainly just organisms. Some organisms literally like older trees. There's a lot of bird species that like older trees. We don't have that many old growth forests anymore because we've chopped them all down. Yes, they regrow, but an old growth forest in and of itself is its own service, its own ecosystem. So just 
something to keep in mind that yes, trees are renewable. That doesn't mean we should chop them all down because there is some downsides to that. But at the same time, they can come back. And we've shown that yes, we can chop down a whole bunch of them, but they come back. Something else I also wanna note uh, is just looking at benefits to the logger. If you think about a logger who can choose between chopping down a whole mountain and make $10,000 versus chopping down a small portion of it and make $1,000, you can kind of understand why they do clear cutting because there's that economic incentive. And we're gonna come back and think about that economic incentive with a lot of these resources. But what's gonna get you more money in the long run? Well, probably the selective cutting. With selective cutting, that forest comes back very quickly. And so maybe every year for 10 years, I can get $1,000 and I get 10,000 at once, but this doesn't come back for 100 years. So in the long run, this can be more financially beneficial, but unfortunately we don't always think that way. So just some ideas as to what's going on and why. Finally, the last renewable resource we'll talk about briefly is fresh water. And I wanna highly emphasize fresh water. There is tons of water on earth. This graph is showing you that of all the water on earth, nearly 98% of it is saline, it's salt water. As humans, we need water, but we can't use salt water. Uh, we can't ingest salt water. You can't, I mean, you could wash your clothes in salt water, but if you've ever been to the beach, they're really not that clean. They're salty. So you kind of want fresh water. So of all the water on earth, only two and a half percent of it is actually fresh water that we can use. Looking at that two and a half percent, if I break that down even more, uh, 68 or we'll just say 70% is in snow and ice. Yes, there are communities that will use that as water, but not many. Uh, many of us are fueled by lakes and rivers and groundwater. So actually a very, very tiny portion of the water available on Earth is even available to us. So just showing you that this is a resource we could use all of. Yes, we know about the water cycle. Things precipitate, they get into a lake or a pond, they evaporate, it rains, so on and so forth. But it is possible to overuse that system. And we'll talk about some examples of that. One example we'll explore is in California. As you're probably familiar, California has a lot of issues relating to water. One is that they always seem to be in a drought. Exasperate that with the fact that there's a ton of people who live in California, and I'm gonna probably assume that those people would like some fresh water. So there's a lot of different rivers that are fueling uh, California, and we're gonna focus kind of on LA. One of the rivers that fuels LA is actually the Colorado River. As you can see, the Colorado River is all the way here to the east. But we have aqueducts, so we have tunnels, we have structures that is funneling that water from the Colorado River all the way to a reservoir that will then be used to fuel LA and surrounding cities. So that's just kind of some background. You may know the Colorado from this picture. So this is the Grand Canyon. The Colorado River is what is responsible for literally carving out the Grand Canyon. But the issue is, is we've taken a ton of water out of it. Not only is California taking it out for their uh, water needs, but also a lot of surrounding states are taking it out for agriculture. Because we think that doing agriculture in the middle of a desert is a great idea. Anyway, so essentially the Colorado River is being tapped dry. Yes, we have a water cycle, but if all of your water is going to agriculture, and then that agriculture is going around the world, then that water is never entering the system again. We're taking it out, but it's not going back in. And that's kind of one of the issues with fresh water is depending on what we do to it, or if we pollute that fresh water, we can't use that fresh water again. No matter how much water cycle happens, we can't get lead out of that water. So this is our Colorado River. But Colorado River is going through a crisis. Here's the end of the Colorado River. This river used to end in Baja, California in a huge body of water. This is down in Mexico. This is the end of the Colorado River. You can see in the background, a interstate bridge used to go over this river 
that no longer exists. So we've been taking so much fresh water out that we don't even leave enough for the people who also live on the river in other countries. Not only is this affecting human populations, obviously, but think about the organisms that live here or used to live here. You've now gotten rid of their habitat and now we're starting water crises around the world. And speaking of water crises, not only is California having some issues, but something pretty famous in the news recently is Cape Town. Cape Town is a pretty industrialized and pretty large city in South Africa. And what's happening there is they too have been having some extreme droughts, but such extreme droughts that they have been limiting their citizens on their water use. California does this too. That's not that weird uh, when you think about the United States. However, it's even worse in Cape Town. They have this thing called Day Zero, and this is kind of what makes them famous. Maybe you've heard of Day Zero, but it's referring to the day that Cape Town would literally have to turn off their taps. Like they wouldn't be able to supply water to anyone in this modern city, which is insane. And you may think, well, there's tons of cities around the world that do doesn't have water. Yes, you're right. And there's a lot of issues with those. But we're talking about saying DC, they're going to turn off your taps, right? It has a very big difference in connotation when we're talking about a big city losing water like that. And so they had this day zero and it was actually supposed to be scheduled originally uh, for April 2018. Based on the weather conditions they had, they thought, okay, April 2018, we're going to have to close off all the taps. Uh, we're not going to have enough water. Fortunately, it's been raining a little bit more. It's been replenishing some of their reservoirs. Uh, currently, day zero is going to be sometime in 2019. And that might push more and more. Now, this isn't, they would run out of this if everyone stayed the same. This is after rationing. Currently, they are rationing to 13 gallons of water a day. This is 13 gallons to cook with, to clean with, to bathe yourself with, to physically drink, using the toilets. Everything that you guys use water for, they get about 13 gallons a day. That is what they're maxed at. For comparison, the average American uses about 90 gallons a day for everything that we do. So as you can imagine, imagine DC and we limited people to just 13 gallons a day when we've been used to 90. You would have riots. There would be so much happening uh, that would be causing such uh, issues in our society. But again, showing you as fresh water as a renewable resource. This happened a lot because of a drought, but it also was affected by the fact that we as humans are also using a lot of it and using more than we actually need. And so it's causing issues like this or issues like this get exasperated when there are natural forces that are also making these issues. So in summary, humans need a lot of different resources, exhaustible, inexhaustible, renewable, and we use them in different ways. And what's great to use would be inexhaustible resources and renewable resources. But if we're going to use renewable resources, it's crucial that we are trying to be sustainable with them, that they can come back just as fast, if not faster than what we're actually using. And that, when you think about your ecological footprint, that's what we're measuring. Is the food you're eating, is the things you're buying, is the home you're living in, is that replacing faster? Are the resources that you use replenishing themselves fast enough for more people to use them in the future? So with that, I'll go ahead and end here. But again, just keep that in mind. What are you using and how long is it going to take for that to come back again?